Rheumatoid arthritis causes painful, swollen joints. Newer treatments can alter the course of this disabling condition. Dr. Jolie is a rheumatologist specializing in this disease. Welcome, Joe. Hi, Larry. So, you know, years ago, I used to see people with tremendous crippling disease, and, and now we don't see it very much. So is it changing? Is the incidence of the disease changing? Or are you guys just so much better? The incidence actually has not changed worldwide. It's the new treatments that have been available in the last 15 years that's actually changed the landscape of how physicians treat rheumatoid arthritis. So you have a few hands that we're going to discuss these later on, but it's really a disease more of the hands or of the whole, all the joints? It's primarily a disease of the small joints. It affects usually the hands and the feet. Mm -hmm. uh, it can affect large joints, uh, the hips, the shoulders, and the knees, but it is more uncommon. Does this happen when you're somebody in their 20s who starts to have like these joint pains or? It can happen in, uh, in any age group. You know, in children, it's uh, now called juvenile idiopathic arthritis, uh -huh. uh, but it can affect young women, uh, older women, middle-aged people. Uh, it's more common in women uh, by uh, two to one. Uh, so it's more common in women. However, men are also affected. So the person who gets this, I mean, we all have aches and pains and joint pain. How do you distinguish this? Like, how do you know you're having something very worrisome? Because if you can intervene early, you can actually change all the deformity from occurring. So when should a patient start to worry about joint pain? There's several different ways to diagnose rheumatoid yeah. arthritis. Number one would be the longevity, the duration of symptoms. Do they have symptoms for more than six weeks? Also, the location of the pain uh, is important. Uh, is it causing swelling? How much pain is it causing? In patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, most of the symptoms are worse in the morning time. So after you sleep and you wake up, the swelling is the worst in the morning, and with activity, it actually improves. So uh, why is that anyway? Why, why is it worse in the morning? Does anybody know? So when you get up in the morning, most people will experience some stiffness lasting 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. In patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, the duration of symptoms are much longer. Uh, if you look at this model here, in a normal hand, you don't wake up with swelling. In patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, you will wake up with swelling that usually affects the metacarpal joints, mm -hmm. the PIP joints, as it's known as, and usually spares the DIP joints. The swelling may last anywhere from 30 minutes to at least an hour. And with activity during the day, it may subside. However, with rest, the symptoms seem to get worse. So if you're having swelling, is that's a more worrisome sign, right? It definitely is. Yeah. And does a patient, when they first get this, should they go to their family doctor first and then see you? Or when is it the time to get this evaluated by a specialist like you? The, the most common type of arthritis is known as osteoarthritis. Okay. And that is what most people will complain of. Can you show me which joints are involved sure. with the osteoarthritis? And patients who have osteoarthritis, the involvement usually involves the DIP joints and the PIP joints. The metacarpal joints, the MCP joints, are usually spared uh, in patients with osteoarthritis, whereas in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, these knuckle joints will be involved. Osteoarthritis is degenerative joint disease? Is correct. that what we call arthritis of old age? Or of whatever? old age, correct. Yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's a problem with cartilage. Oh, so I see. The cartilage surrounds the ends of all the joints, okay. and it provides a basically a cushion for all the joints. Mm -hmm. And with overuse, with the activity, uh, these these cartilage areas diminish or they degrade, mm -hmm. and over time you have exposure of bone. Now, what happens when cartilage wears down, you get the formation of bone spurs, and that causes osteoarthritis. Say a patient has this swelling at home or painful joints, and they take Advil and everything gets better. Is that a sign that it's osteo versus rheumatoid, or that it's not, not good enough? The location is the most important location. where they're having pain. Um, Motrin does work for both osteoarthritis and for rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So just because the symptoms are alleviated doesn't necessarily distinguish the two diseases. So that's not a distinguishing feature. So for the persons watching this show, they should seek uh, help based on duration and the and the location and the, of the location. Pain. What should they expect when they come and see somebody like you? Should they do you start with X-rays, MRIs, CT scans? What do you what do they really expect when they see you? So rheumatologists, we're, we're actually good about feeling patients. So examining joints are what we're experts in. We have a lot of training and we can actually tell patients the location of the swelling. Mm -hmm. We can also tell them the severity of the swelling. And that is the most important feature of a rheumatologist, yeah. uh, being able to discern what is swelling and what causes that swelling. So when a person comes to you, you could tell them almost right up off the bat what it is. The majority of the time, yeah. uh, history is the most important. As, as you and I know, 
listening to a patient's symptoms, the duration of symptoms, location of symptoms, uh, and then examining their hands, their wrists, their elbows, their shoulders is very important to diagnose uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And that's one of its major clinical criteria. Do you ever have to stick needles in there to, to aspirate the joint to figure out what it is? or Usually not. Mm -hmm. um, there are rare instances where rheumatoid arthritis can occur in one joint. It's very, very rare, but it does occur. And occasionally we do joint aspirations or even synovial biopsies mm -hmm. to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis in those patients. So they come to you, okay, now you say, well, I think you have rheumatoid arthritis. What do you do next? The next step is to uh, order x-rays um, and also order laboratory testing. In the early onset of disease, your x-rays may not show any damage, which is good. Obviously, if your x-rays at the early stages show you have what we call erosions or damage within the articular cartilage, those patients would usually be treated more aggressively. So there's value and it makes the diag helps with the diagnosis, but it helps with the therapy. As well, correct. And it's also used for monitoring. Mm -hmm. So if you're, once you're on treatment, especially with the new treatments, we've shown that many of these new treatments prevent the joint damage from occurring and progressing. So you know if you're being successful, not only by the symptoms getting better, but by your x-rays not Absolutely. deteriorating. Absolutely. Is that cut and dry? I see joint erosion, you get on the most powerful drugs, or is it, do you try something, the milder drugs first? Not necessarily. That's where the difficulty lies yeah. in our clinical practice, is judgment. Yeah. What medicines to put these patients on initially, uh, and how aggressive you should be. I use it based on different features. You know, if their laboratory testing shows very aggressive disease mm -hmm. with, lo uh, with high inflammation markers, known as a high CRP or a high SED rate, mm -hmm. those patients we may treat a little bit more aggressively up front. Your age may also uh, play a, uh, an important factor. If you come in and you're in your 20s and you have aggressive disease, these patients have a long time to hopefully have a healthy life. Mm -hmm. And we'd like these patients to regain normal function. In order to do that, we have to have them on medicine strong enough to hopefully get these patients into what we now call remission. So th the mild medicines, or, or what, what are the mild medicines? Unfortunately, there's, not noth <laughs> no there, there's nothing mild, I guess, <laughs> in, in our line of treatment. We distinguish it between oral therapy uh, and then these new biologic therapies. The oral therapies have been around for more than 20 to 30 years, and they're still the mainstay of treatment. Okay. And the majority of patients are still on those medications. Uh, however, you know, you have a subset of patients that don't respond, and then because of the advancement of these new medications, uh, they've expanded and basically exploded the, the practice of rheumatology. So what are the standard, what, is it like Advil or Motrin? So anti-inflammatories yeah. can be used. Yeah. Uh, in very mild cases of rheumatoid arthritis, it can be used. Uh, however, it has not been shown that it prevents joint destruction or joint damage from occurring. So, th you know, so that's the key, really. Correct. You want them to feel better, but you don't want them to get a destroyed joint that's disabling. So then the next level of treatment is what? What are these new drugs called? So these are called biologic medications. Mm -hmm. So once you pass oral medicines like methotrexate, leflutamide, anti-inflammatory medications, uh, older drugs like hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine are still used, but mm -hmm. they're not used that commonly. Uh, the new, these new medications called biologic medications, and when I started, there was just two. There was Enbrel and there was Remicade. But now that has expanded. Now there are, you know, Enbrel, Remicade, Humira, Simzia, Symphony. There's even oral, new oral medication that's currently available. Those are usually in the hands of you guys, right? A, a family doctor is not going to want to handle those drugs, I don't think. Most of the time, uh, just because of the lack of expertise using the medication, as well as the dosing and the frequency and monitoring these patients, it's important to see your rheumatologist to, especially on these uh, newer medications, to be followed by them closely. Okay. And what, with this hand here, is there anything unique feature here with this model here? Yeah, so what we like to prevent in patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, as you can see in this model here, mm -hmm. uh, is the damage. So when we talk erosions, what actually happens is the fluid that's in the joint. Uh, the fluid in the joint is bad for the joint. And what it's so inflammatory, it actually chews up the bone. And that's what we call an erosion. So we're almost done. I just have one last question. So what, do you th what is the future? Is it going to be vaccines? Or what, what do you think the future is for this treatment? We know rheumatoid is an autoimmune disorder. Uh, Meaning, what does that mean? So an autoimmune disorder is a problem in which your immune system uh, decides to attack its own body. And rheumatoid arthritis is the most common of those autoimmune disorders. And so we now know that genetically, we can actually locate the different chromosomes that causes oh, really? rheumatoid arthritis. It still only accounts for about a third of the cases. 
So two thirds of the cases, we still don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but there's new therapies that are available. Rheumatoid arthritis is one of those therapies where we have antibody treatments for, and they work excessively well. Uh, new treatments will probably work even better, and we may ultimately be able to detect your case of rheumatoid arthritis, what's causing your rheumatoid arthritis to be active, and to target that uh, inflammatory problem. So there'll be one day you can potentially cure this, right? It potentially. We're hoping in the next 10 to 15 years there'll be a lot better treatment than we have currently. That's great. Well, I learned a lot today. We're out of time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Good. Thanks for coming.